Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I speak with David Hingley, Head of Visitor Experience at Tate. We discuss the visitor experience restructure at Tate, why people make places, and how visitor experience makes crazy ideas happen. If you like what you hear, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's lovely to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for having me on. You are very welcome. Well, as ever, we are going straight into icebreaker questions. And I would like to know, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? At the moment, I think I would like to live, this would be popular with some people I know, in Iceland. Uh, and it's because uh, we went years ago on a whale watching trip uh, to Iceland and the coast and it was fantastic. And ever since I've wanted to go back, I just it is just completely different to anywhere else I've been on, I think, on the planet. And, and like a week wasn't enough. Totally agree with you. It, I, I, we went 27, oh, 2017, maybe around then. Absolutely spectacular. Like you say, so different to anywhere that we'd ever experienced before. Like bonkers, bonkers snow and weather and just everything is icy, but magic, absolutely magic. Yeah. And like the belief in that magic as well is like the whole mythology and stuff that's going on there. But also, I loved at the end of it all, we were in the back beyond for a lot of the trip, obviously, but we're in Reykjavik and it was. I think it was 20 degrees and everyone was complaining how hot it was. And we went to this little coffee shop and it was all as if you were in the busiest part of London. But there were honestly maybe three, four people there. And it was like, you're in the big city now. You know, this is how we roll. And I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> did you, while we're on this t- subject, did you eat the fermented shark? Yes. Not so much. Bad. Not very much at all. So bad. Jet, we- so bad. We had a tour guide who was very keen that we did, and we did the very British polite thing, but it was not good. <laughs> was not for me, David, either. <laughs> okay. Would you rather be a superhero, and what would be your superhero talent, or the world's best chef? Oh. I, th- I feel like my family would say that if I was the world's best chef, that would be a super talent compared with where we are at the moment. <laughs> I'm not really sure about being a superhero. I Yeah, I think I'd rather be a chef. I think there's a lot rested on you as a superhero. I'm not sure, especially after the last few years, I'm not sure I could deal with it. So uh, I think to be a chef and have people come and enjoy the food, that'd be great. I'm not sure how my signature dish of toad in the hole, followed by like a kind of version of school dinners, chocolate, concrete and custard would go down. But um, I'm sure I could deconstruct it. So the toad be- in the hole sounds okay. Yeah. Uh, the rest that came afterwards, let's <laughs> just park that, shall we? <laughs> okay. And I don't ask enough people this, and I should, but often it's like, you know, asking what your favorite child is. Uh, but what is your favorite attraction? That is. It's a hard one, isn't it? It's so down to, I think a lot of it's down to what your mood is at the time. I'm going to, like, it's predictable. I'm, I'm I probably, probably go for Hampton Court, you know? I know I've worked there, but um, I do still. I, the reason I say that is, even though I kind of know how it's done, I still love going back and visiting it, um, and I can like properly enjoy it as a visitor now. Because um, I was a visitor before, then I worked there, now I'm a visitor again, and like it's still, it's still got something about it because there's so many different facets to it, like with the gardens or the kind of, it's family friendly, it's got all the history. So yeah, that would be my favourite attraction. That's good. That's good that you can you can step away from it having been having worked there because I think sometimes that might ruin it a little bit for you. So it's good that it's still yeah. got the magic. Great answer. Thank you very much. All right, it's time for your unpopular opinion. What have you prepared for us? I feel quite strongly that Ant and Deck's early work was their superior period. Uh, as much as I know the nation loves Ant and Deck, I think you look back on Let's Get Ready to Rumble. I think you know the fact that when they revisited that, it went. You know, everyone was so pleased. For me, that shows, you know, the quality was there from the start. And I think growing up, you know, Grange Hill might have done like just say no to drugs, which was, you know, very, very laudable. Yeah. Ant and Deck were, you know, in Biker Grove and we got that warning about the dangers of paintball. 
And for anyone in my generation that had to go on a lot of management away days where people thought it'd be fun <laughs> if we did stuff like paintball, I think that kind of early warning was kind of important. <laughs> And yeah, wonky donkey. I mean, you're never going to beat that. Oh my God. <laughs> wonky donkey is the best. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like an aggressive a deck, is there? Nothing. It's just, it's no. glorious. Saturday morning with a bit of a hangover, watching them basically losing it with kids who were trying to answer a very simple question. I mean, I don't know why they don't bring that back on Saturday takeaway or something like that. I just think it would... I do think it's a superior period. I mean, I like what they do now, but I think they've kind of they've lost they've lost some of the edge. Got to be honest. <laughs> I agree with you, David. So I am completely on the same page with you. Ant and Deck were like, yeah, they're, they're like my little heroes that I grew up with. I actually saw them perform "Let's Get Ready to Rumble" live once at an under 18s gig uh, in Romford. <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why that was important, but yeah, it was uh, it was it was a great great moment. Really great moment. Thank you. Let's no see worries. what let's see what our listeners feel. <laughs> Please tweet me. Let me know how you feel about Ant and Dex's earlier work and whether they should bring back Wonky Donkey, obviously. <laughs> right, David, let's go on to the serious stuff. I'd like to know a little bit about, about your background. You alluded to the fact that you've worked in other attractions as well. So tell us about your background and, and, and where you're at to now. So my background's kind of fairly mixed and quite a lot of different things. Years ago, my daughter reminds me, years ago I did a degree in history. Absolutely loved it. And my parents always said, oh, what, you know, you know what, you know what will happen with that. You'll end up working, working in a shop because like nobody knows what to do with the degree in history. So I proved them right. and went and worked in shops and I worked for Sainsbury's on the graduate training scheme. I thought I'll do it for 12 months, just get some great um, knowledge and then I'll move on. So I did that for seven years, did different jobs there, uh, night shift managers, fruit and veg managers, that kind of stuff. Because I just like working with the people. Mm-hmm. Um, then I went and worked for M&S um, when like running department stores was still like a thing. So uh, <laughs> I spent, um, oh, I spent seven years with M&S. So I did, uh, I was a food hall manager because that's what they do with anyone who's come from supermarkets. Um, and I worked in some really uh, interesting shops. I worked on the King's Road, which is kind of like quite a fancy place, obviously. Yeah. Ken High Street, where we used to have flamingos on the roof because the roof gardens were above us. So Amazing. that was quite cool. Um, and then Marble Arch on Oxford Street um so yeah kind of but all the time I was thinking I'd like I'd really like to do something that I felt more at home with and reading my history books on my breaks and um, then uh Hampton Court advertised uh for a kind of head of visitor services I think it was and I thought or I'll give that I'll give that a go so I <laughs> stuck my CV in and um yeah I, I was successful I got the job um which feels like a real cheat because I know how hard people work and you know I feel like I had loads of transferable skills mm. Um, and the organisation took a bit of a flyer on me. Um, and I know that's true because on the first morning when I started, I was having a coffee with the director and he's like very, you can imagine all the rooms at Hampton Court are very grand. It's quite a grand room. And he just said, it's amazing who comes out top of these recruitment processes, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Which I think was well meant, but um, yeah, it was. So then I um, got to work at Hampton Court um, I did, uh, it was head of his services and it kind of became head of operations, like as those roles always kind of change names. And we had the Olympics, the Jubilee, we had the Magic Garden opened, which was massive for Hampton Court when the, the kids uh, kids' garden opened. I was involved with the Tower of London when they did um, the poppies in the moat as well. Oh, so amazing. remember the delivery of every one of those because that was part of the team I was involved in, delivering them for like a year afterwards. And then I did a bit of time at Landmark Trust, where I was the chief operating officer. Um, They've got about 200 uh, historic buildings all over the country. Um, Rescue them. Um, If they're not big enough to be a tourist attraction, you can get the keys to a castle and stay there for a weekend, uh, which is amazing. But um, they don't like you popping in to see how their holiday is going, those uh, (laughs) visitors. Um, And so you miss all the, or I I missed all the kind of of visitor interaction. Um, So then the Tate role came up, which is um, Tate Britain and Tate Modern. Um, and working with the teams looking after the day-to-day visitor experience so um, I've been doing that for a couple of years although sometimes feels like longer given the last year and a bit um, imagine yeah, yeah. I could imagine. so that's so that's really potted history of kind of how I ended up where I am yeah and so you so it's Tate and Tate so sorry Tate Modern and Tate Britain yes so what does what does a typical day for you look like then are you rushing from one to the other and working out what the hell's going on not as much as it used to be <laughs> Thanks to Zoom, um, used to spend quite a bit of time on the boat going between the two sites, which anyone who works at Tate will tell you it's quite nice if you've got to go from Tate Modern to Tate Britain for a meeting, you can get the boat 
because you feel like a tourist for that kind of 25 minutes. I know this sounds like every glossy catalogue, but there isn't a typical day. Mm -hmm. Um, So whilst my teams are making sure the doors are open and all the exhibitions are staffed and we're like, we're all looking ready to go and everything. My job is kind of, I kind of think 50% thinking about what's going on at the moment. Um, and I often say, like, I have to think about the worst day out anyone can have and then stop that happening. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> like, in the last year with COVID, how do you open sites with COVID and make them st- make sure they're still fun? Um, and then the other 50% is kind of looking at what's coming next. So um, typical days can be in the mornings, I could be in meetings about um, exhibitions that are going to open up at Tate Britain or Tate Modern in the next kind of two years, 12 months or kind of just around the corner um then there's all the stuff around looking after the team um one-to-ones with uh colleagues look after the the senior teams at each site planning what we're going to do to kind of train everybody up on whatever's coming next all of the uh, business continuity planning stuff making sure that we're operating safely um thinking about risk assessments kind of uh all the the fun stuff all the fun stuff yeah (laughs) we sort of i sort of say if it's kind of tricky tedious or terrifying it's probably going to fall into the operations team's pop um not in a bad way because we like doing all that stuff but yeah a mix of project planning thinking about how we work with the programming teams and bring that to life and then looking after our own teams day to day and making sure they've got what they need to to kind of get through a day and, and operate smoothly and I can only imagine how reactive that has needed to be over the past 18 months and potentially the next few months to come <laughs> yeah constantly constantly um <laughs> And I kind of think the trick is kind of finding the spot as well between being reactive and trying to be proactive, which has been even harder um, in the last year, because you know, many of us don't know what's going to happen until the evening before, do we? No, no. And then you found out from Bernard on, in his updates rather yes. than the government. <laughs> yeah, Bernard and his flowers in his updates. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Famous flowers. So we've been we've been kind of emailing back with and forth and talking about different topics for the podcast and and one of the things that you mentioned that I think is really interesting is is about the visitor experience restructure that you were looking at at Tate and you said it actually accelerated a not change program so talk us through what you talk us through what you mean by that because I'd love to understand what you know one how that came about and two what it kind of looks like Yeah, kind of fortunate, unfortunate. I took the job about two and a half years ago. Um, So I didn't have that long, really, before COVID to kind of get my head around the two sites, Tate, the way things worked. But when I started, we were, the the role was very much, it was a kind of slight rejigging of roles, as happens in organisations. And so I was talking to, obviously, the team that recruited me about what it was they wanted from the role. And it was about moving from if you like a more traditional visitor service visitor operations to engagement engagement was a big word that was used a lot and I don't think any of us were quite sure exactly what that meant (laughs) and it was quite terrifying for some of the team not because they can't do it but because the word was used a lot and the team were like well we do engage with people we talk to people all the time you know or we were taken on as a gallery assistants back in the day when engagement would be mean telling someone to back off if they got too close to a painting (laughs) because it was our job to protect the stuff it was always going to be about um working out how we could change uh the way that we worked as a team because Tate obviously used to millions of visitors operated very smoothly I mean you go in and do your kind of case in the joint before you go for the interview and you can see there's kind of a well-oiled machine but one of the things is that it can be kind of quite hot and cold as you go around the building. You can have brilliant individual interactions and then there are vast buildings. There's other areas where you don't meet anyone. Right. So how can you kind of help a thinly spread team uh, to kind of embody the place and have confidence and, and, and get it right for all kinds of visitors from a visitor who take moderns wandered in off the South Bank just to have a look around because they're curious to someone who's come to take Britain on a mission to see a particular painting because that you know that's what they want to see that's their day out really I call it I call it a bit of a not change program because it deliberately didn't do a change program because I think as soon as you start saying like I'm the new person I'm here to do a change program it terrifies terrifies people mm. quite often everybody knows that if somebody new turns up when there's a new structure that there is going to be change so rather than um labeling it in that way what I did and what my team did and what we agreed to do was kind of was to work collectively on what that needed to look like because many of the visitor assistants they knew what they wanted to do differently 
And so it was a case of doing a lot of, I don't know, it sounds kind of slightly old hat, but kind of focus groups, discussion groups with those teams to kind of just tease out of them what great service looked like, what got in the way of delivering it, how they would like things to be different. And then being able to kind of almost play that back to the teams and use that to shape the changes that we were going to make. And you can write a lot of that down in advance on, on the back of a, an envelope, if you like, because you know, genuinely know what people feel makes a good experience or you can generally guess what the barriers are going to be. But it's about kind of making sure you've uncovered that all as a team. Mm -hmm. So we really took Tate, fortunately for me, had just kind of had some new values that they've been working on again as, a, as an organisation around being kind, rigorous, open and bold. So what we were able to do was we were able to say, well, I was able to say, I'm, I'm not sure how a painting or a piece of art is kind, but I know how a person can do that. Um, if I come in as a visitor and I'm looking a bit lost or uh, my kids desperately need the toilet and I need to find it fast. Yeah. Um, so we took on thinking about how we as people embody Tate's values and kind of really pulling it all back to that, which on the one hand can sound a bit corporate, but actually I think it was really important that we, uh, what we wanted to do was build a common language and a way of talking so we could sort of hold ourselves to account and work out whether we'd had a good day or not. It's interesting because it? when you talk about it like that from the from the aspect of, you know, our values, it, it feels very much that the visitor experience is, is almost about giving it's giving people the allowance to 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 do what they need to do in that time. We had Liz Power on from um, Water and Steam a few weeks ago, and that was one of the things that she spoke about um, in her team is that she she empowers them to make the right decision about a cir circumstance. And that might be somebody who's come up and that somebody gets to, to give a free ticket away to somebody for their for them and their family and that that to me sounds very similar to what you're talking about yeah I think I think it is it is about that and it can be really hard particularly in big institutions where you've got people let's be honest standing in certain spaces and galleries because I mean that's part of the insurance and the fire evacuation right that's that's what's led to a person being stood there first and foremost and you and you've got to do that and it's really important but then how can you um, enable that person still to kind of bring themselves? And, you know, a lot of my team, they're highly skilled. A lot of them are artists. Um, you know, they, you know, this is another job that they do. So it's how you, how you can enable them to, to bring that to an institution and yet still kind of have a feel of like, okay, this is Tate. This is what Tate feels like. Yeah. How, how difficult was this to do when, because I guess, did this start just before the pandemic? We started just before the pandemic with all my kind of like, having talked to everybody and we kind of set the direction and there was this brilliant five year five year plan as we all, as we all do and this is what we're going to do in year and one and then it got ripped into <laughs> tiny little pieces absolutely <laughs> and it was hard most of the uh the, the core team were, were furloughed because you know we went open um so I think what we did those of us who were still in was we we kind of already pitched where we were going to the team so then we were able to do in one sense alongside planning how to reopen we we're allowed to do a lot of a lot of work on how you know what kind of material we needed so training materials what kind of just going back and basic stuff like we have a handbook for people so just getting that all tidied up so it kind of really captured the role and then we were already thinking about what changes to the job role we would want to make um because the key change I think in terms of the restructures actually have been keen to make sure people understand the skills involved in being a gallery assistant, for example, or we call it a visitor engagement assistant. Now, we do laugh and say that all of our jobs have gained an extra letter. So um, <laughs> the visitor engagement managers and our visitor engagement and operations managers, because that kind of shows the breadth of their job. Mm. Um, and we have redone everybody's job descriptions based on the fact that as time's gone on, people have taken on a lot more of the kind of the kind of security aspects and kind of the duty management aspects become bigger. You know, people are more demanding. We deal with more incidents um, than we used to in the past. Mm. Um, and for the visitor assistants, you know, there were seven things on their job description, which I think somebody thought was kind of, let's keep it nice and simple and have some basic stuff on there. But actually it meant a lot of the time the team were, the team themselves said they felt they were defined by what they weren't. So okay. and we were able to kind of, take some of those ideas and suggestions that I had and kind of incorporate them into a job description and have that ready for when they returned. And then when we returned and we we're back in the galleries, then we've been again doing the same process. We went through what the proposed changes were, what that would mean. 
um, and getting people to, you know, to, to buy into it and agree to it. Do you think that that was harder to do because of the pandemic, try, trying to kind of get people motivated to make those changes? Physically harder to do. Everything's been hard, I think, from a mental health point of view for people in terms of the backwards and forwards of the pandemic. But I think some of the changes that would potentially people would have seen as major, actually, in the scheme of all our lives and what's happened in the last year and a bit, people were, people were, you know, they're almost like, oh, gosh, is this all you want me to do? (laughs) Phew. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And, you know, I also think one thing that's helped a lot is during the, during the, period when we've been in and out and at the moment we've got people working from home largely if they can office based and most of my team um we're it we're in most of the time you know some of my team have to be in all the time you can only do your job face to face yeah but it really showed how it sounds daft because it's obvious but it really showed how important those teams are and the kind of the weight that they take on and we found that because there's been a what's the latest legislation how does it work how does, you know and you go to the operational teams because they're dealing with it all the time that the teams get much more listened to than we perhaps did in the past because it's been really necessary and really important yeah and I think I think the organization as a whole I didn't ever intended not to listen to those teams but I think it's just kind of fine-tuned the need to to hear what's said and what the experience is on the ground yeah it's really interesting how have you been able to to test the impact of the program based on I mean yeah you've been open for pockets of time obviously clearly open at the moment let's hope that that continues how how has how have you been able to test it with the general public yeah so I mean there's a few things that we've done uh we've started doing a mystery visitor I mean that's not groundbreaking loads of people do it but I think it's good to have a kind of a snapshot um so we started to do that before um, we ran some of our training. So we've we worked with a company called The Whole Story on our customer engagement style, if you like. Um, and we ran sessions on that before we reopened last time in the last lockdown. Um, so we're able to benchmark where we were before and where we are now. And uh, we've seen positive movements. I mean, we're in a good place. We're in a better place, um, right. and especially around consistency. The feedback we get from visitors, because we've had booked tickets, which we haven't had before for the free collection so there are issues with that but one of the positives is we ask people for feedback afterwards and we get really good rates of response and those responses have been we saw them become more positive over time so I think part of that is because we've got better with our COVID measures and some of that but also positive comments about staff and and what they're doing and I think there's another element of reopening after the first lockdown certainly we did have visitors in tears because they were seeing uh, seeing staff again that they hadn't oh. seen for ages or just been the spaces. And I think that um, probably gave some of the team confidence yeah. to uh, to realise that they do play a significant part in people's lives, even if those people don't spend a lot of time interacting with them, don't know, don't know them by name. Some of them they do, but it's, you know, that that's kind of reaffirmed the importance. So we've seen more, pos- more positive comments, definitely. Um, and I think that is testament to how hard the team have all worked as well, actually, because it, it's been it's been a tough time generally. Yeah. What an amazing reaction, though, isn't that just lovely? That, that I mean, that really that really showcases how important people are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, what tips would you give other organisations, attractions that are thinking about going through this? How could you? What what tips can you offer them for going through this process? Again, it's tried and tested, but definitely over communicating all the time. I mean, I'm not going to say, um, you know, obviously there have been times when some of the stuff we've been doing has not been so popular with some of the team. And I kind of understand that. And I think it was important to hear that um, and to be honest about what uh, I could change and what I couldn't change. I do think there's a there's a point around um, when it didn't go well. And I can think of at least one occasion when I, I I stuffed up um, when I just went out to everybody and went, do you know what? I stuffed up. You know, there was an email you shouldn't have received. It wasn't particularly bad, but you shouldn't have received that email timing wise. I wanted to make sure that I communicated things differently, but I did the classic thing and sent it to the wrong people. I just went straight out and said to everybody, I stuffed up. Um, yeah. And a lot of the team came back and said that we really respect that. Um, then we just quickly arranged meetings afterwards. I think we we did we did listen um, and we made changes to the proposals in some areas so uh if i take this idea of more engagement 
I know some of the team have worked with us for over 20 years and they're fantastic uh, and we don't want to lose them. But what we're asking them to do is very different from what they signed up for. Um, and I think, you know, we would, I, I used to joke, or I still do, that some people were worried that engagement meant kind of almost juggling in front of their favourite painting. And it doesn't. <laughs> if you've been there for 20 years and you've seen Tate Britain evolve or Tate Modern from when it opened, those people have got great stories to tell. So what we've got, for example, in one of the job descriptions is there's almost kind of three options where it's like, if you want to be a, you know, someone who knows the history of the building and shares it with people, build that up and do that. And that's your interaction. Uh, but that'll be what you work on. If you want to give a talk in front of people, great, you can work on that. And we need people like that. And it's part of our recruitment process now. We'd recruit people who wanted to do that. But if you're someone who joined us before then, and that's not your thing, but you've got years and years of research, as some of my team do, um, then you can, by all means, provide that content for somebody else to deliver the talk for you. Brilliant. So trying to just, I suppose, again, it's an element of being realistic and working with with the team you've got, because none of us are great at everything. So, so long as we've got all the bases covered and everybody's kind of pulling their weight, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to create. Yeah. It's, it's playing to everybody's strengths, using everybody's talents in the best possible way and not making anyone feel excluded because they're not comfortable standing up in front of an audience and, and delivering, or they're not, you know, that that's just not their bag, but they have got the knowledge and yeah. someone else can do that for them as well. I really love that idea of being able to collaborate with people to, to share to share your experiences. Fantastic. And is this leading anywhere? I feel like this this change program could be could be rolled out yeah. elsewhere, yeah. couldn't it? Yeah, well, um, I really I have been talking to colleagues. I really feel that um it's we're at we're in a tough time. We've got um we're all going to be struggling in different ways and in different you know different contexts with things like budgets and it's always hard to get people off the floor to do training it's something that we've struggled with for a long time so one of the things I'm keen to do is to work with other institutions and say you know we're running you know this is the range of training programs we're running for front of house teams at Tate what are you doing where's there some crossover if we've got a room and we can get five people in it and you've got a couple of people that want to come along and see what that's like well, why don't we start to to pair up? I don't think there's enough. And I know different organisations have done it at different times, but I think if we want to change the change the way we look at front of house teams, um, you know, it's quite hard. You can be a start in your career and you might start as a visitor engagement assistant at Tate and it might not be where you want to be long term, but often people can get stuck there and think well how do I get to the next the next place and it's hard when you're in that role as well to to, to network etc so yeah. if we can open up opportunities for someone to go and do a few shifts at, um, at a different site for example and I can kind of backfill and swap it around between us because we know our teams have got very similar skills um, then I feel like that's something that um, that we could really be doing more more of and that um, organizations like Tate you know we've got an opportunity to to help to do that. Um, Love that. It's building on what we've seen in the sector throughout the whole of the pandemic, isn't it? That kind of collaboration that's really come through. And it's been there. It has been there to a certain extent, but it's been it's been, you know, so much deeper whilst the pandemic has been going on, everybody helping each other. And and something that you said about the networking thing, when when people are in those kind of entry level um, roles, that's something that we spoke about with. with Rachel and Colton uh, quite a long time ago, actually right towards the beginning Mm. of the pandemic, actually about the visitor experience forum. Um, And that was the reason that that organization was kind of set up to be able to give that platform to some of those audiences as well. So I can definitely see the benefits of, of what you're suggesting, the organizations working together for the greater good. I think that's a fantastic idea. That comes back to something else that you talked about as well, when we were emailing, I love that segue so well in there. (laughs) But you said, you know, you'd like people to to understand that that visitor experience is uh, sort of visitor engagement is a is a career choice, yeah. and that your your um your quote was people make places, visitor experience, visitor engagement. I keep saying it wrong. Sorry, sweet. visitor um experience make crazy ideas happen. Yeah. I love this. I love this. Where's this come from? So um, so yeah. People make places and um, my team now roll their eyes and repeat and like, everybody repeats it, which is great, actually. That's, um, 
but it comes from years ago when I went to an MS actually. It's where it, where it kind of triggered the idea. And I don't think they used the phrase, but we went to, and they used to do big conferences back in the day and get the store managers along. And they showed this big black and white film. It was our latest store that was about to open. And it was all black and white from it all looked beautiful, but it was all black and white. And then they put the people in, uh, which was the staff and the customers, and they turned it all to colour. And it was like a goosebump moment, oh. which is supposed to be. And, they, you know, it was, but it did sort of stick with me. And then when I started working in um, in this, the heritage sector, um, it's not a criticism, but I think it is genuinely surprising to me how many areas of the organisation just don't, because they don't interact with people in the same way. They're not out there seeing what the visitors are doing. Um, and sometimes I bet that's a blessing for them. And sometimes I think they're really missing out. Um, but we've all got our jobs to do. And I think there's a real, when I get emails in, when we get emails in, and it's emails now rather than letters, it's never like I came, well, very rarely is it, I came to Tate and the art was amazing because like that's a given. Like you come to Tate, you expect the art. You might not like it, it might not be to your taste, but you know, you know, it's at a certain standard. Or the buildings were amazing. Well, you expect the buildings to be amazing. At Hampton Court, same thing. You know, it's a palace. It's going to look good. Um, but people write in and say, I met um, Frank or I met, you know, James, and he told me why he loved this painting or a story about this room, or he opened a hidden door and showed my my child, you know, what was through there. And that's what sticks with people. Yeah. So it's the thing that you don't immediately come up on your Google search or isn't in the guidebook. Those are the kind of moments when memories get made. And Bernard always says kind of stuff, not stuff. I think it's a version of that, really. It's like the stuff's important, but the people make the interaction and they're what you come back for. Um, so that's that element. Um, and I think it is, it is definitely a career. I think um, I know lots of people join front of house teams and they want to get on and work in other areas of um, heritage, culture, attractions. And that's absolutely fine. But I think we need to be quite honest about where we can get people. And we managed to get to a point when I was at Hampton Court where at the end of a summer season, quite a lot of our staff would get stolen by interpretation or uh, you know membership or other teams because they knew they were good with people. Mm. And that's great. But there's only a limited number of opportunities. And I used to say to people, you can't hang around in the Great Hall at Hampton Court and hope that Lucy Worsley is going to pluck you from obscurity and make you curator because that isn't how it works. So it's about people using their in to kind of look at where they want to go um, and to understand what they might need to do to get other roles rather than kind of, I think it, it's just a bit disingenuous to kind of leave people thinking if they work really hard front of house that they're definitely going to get, uh, get a different role. But then I would also encourage people to stay front of house, stay in the teams that I get to work in because I look at the meetings and other people's diaries. I say I don't have a typical day. I don't know many of the people that get to go along and kind of talk about future acquisitions uh, for Tate in terms of paintings, go and go along to what's the next project that's coming up, hear about, you know, what a curator's working on next, then be in a meeting about membership, then, you know, the variety, you get to stick your oar in everywhere when you work in visitor experience. <laughs> so, um, so that's cool. And I think, yeah, we used to have um, museum studies group come every year to Hampton Court. And I always think if I can convert just one of those 35 people who are all hoping to become curators or similar to operations, then that's like a win. <laughs> I really, yeah. And that's where the crazy ideas happen thing comes in. And you can dispute whether the ideas are crazy, but, you know, I've been in meetings where somebody says, we're going to plant 888,246 poppies in the Tower of London Moat and then sell them around the world. And everyone's gone, really? Or we're going to have a pie that opens up every day and the kid's going to jump out of it in front of Elizabeth I. The kid that's going to go in the pie is going to be one of the visitors' kids. Oh, right, OK, so that's like safeguarding risk assessment. You know, <laughs> we built a dragon that, get, you know, gave out, gave out steam in the kid's garden. Um, you know, there's all kinds of issues there you've got to think about. So I think operations teams can be seen as people that say no quite a lot. Um, and sometimes there's good reasons, but actually the job is more kind of yes, if, um, or how do we do that? And that's, I think it's a really creative job and people don't see it like that. That, they, that needs to go on your job ads, doesn't it? <laughs> Come and work with a team that, 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 that puts children into pies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe not amazing. maybe not so much like that but you know that but that's that's part and parcel of it isn't it I think um I, I spoke to to Kate Nichols from UK Hospitality about the you know the 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 um 
the real challenge that, that that we've got at the moment with recruitment in that sector. And I think it's it's about making the best of it. It's about finding those hooks that make it an interesting place to be and to explain the career path. You know, actually a lot of front of house, they might only be thinking in one way. They might be re- relatively narrow minded in the sense of that that's the way that they see that their career going, where mm. it's about showcasing all of these brilliant things that they could go on and do but making it fun and making it interesting. Like, you know, some of the things that you've just described, I wouldn't have even put in the operations hat, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is it, because operations is so different at different places as well. You kind of have operations, experience, visitor services, engagement, and and they're all so different. Some people doing my job are are looking after all of the maintenance as well. I've done the job where I've looked after security at the moment. I work with security. I don't have to look after them. It's all, it's so often it is configured around what what it isn't. So it's really clear what a curatorial job is, for example. I'm not picking on that. It just is really clear. And if you ask most members of the public who works in the museum, the first thing they'll say is a curator, understandably. Yeah. Um, but they don't really appreciate like all the different jobs that surround that. Um, I think that's a problem because then people think it's not the place for them. Yeah. And if yes. you want a more diverse workforce, it's about saying, well, this is, you know, these are the opportunities we've got. This is the stuff we do. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. David, thank you. I've really enjoyed this talk. We always end the podcast with a book recommendation from our guests, something that they love or something that's helped shape their career in some way. It can be anything. What have you got for us today? I had a real think about this. Um, It's tricky. I always recommend any book by John Falk. Got one here at the moment. He's just got one out called The Value of Museums. You've probably come across him. I'm sure quite a lot of people would have come across him. I think he writes brilliantly about not just museums, but about all the kind of baggage that we all bring on our visit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he really, in his writing, gets that um, when somebody rocks up, um, we do a lot of work on things like personas, all of us, but you can be in a different persona depending on who you come with. Like my experience when I used to take my daughter when she was small round somewhere would be that I'd see the whole exhibition at a million miles an hour, maybe read one label. <laughs> because uh, then we're off to get a brownie and a cup of tea but if I went on if I went on my day off on my own could be there for two hours it could be a completely different visit and I think he really gets that in his writing I think it's really he really kind of sums up the operational side of it um, and then I've got a slightly off the wall one which is um, Dylan Thomas the Dylan Thomas omnibus has his uh, has his broadcasts in about um, you know so he just used to do weekly broadcasts and I pulled one out because He's got a bit about the Festival of Britain exhibition in 1951. Right. He just (laughs) totally gets what visitors are like. I don't know whether I could kind of read you just a paragraph of it. Please do. Bridge people. If you work in um, visitor attractions, look it up. Because uh, he talks about visitor flow, basically. Um, So this is the exhibition in 1951. And it says... Most people who wish at the beginning anyway to make sense of the exhibition follow the course indicated in the official guidebook. A series of conflicting arrows which lead many visitors who cannot understand these things splash dash into the Thames and work their way dutifully right through the land of Britain, the glaciers of 20,000 years ago, the inferno of blown desert sand, which is now Birmingham, out at last to the Pavilion of Health, where perhaps they stop for an envious moment at the sign that says euthanasia. (laughs) And it just goes on. It talks about levitating doors and it, I mean, and basically how people prefer the cafe to the rest of the, the site. Um, so it's, it's like four or five pages, but I would recommend looking it up. I can't find it anywhere else. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, he really did get it, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Wasted as a poet. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Um, listen, as ever, if you'd like to win a copy of David's books, is, it, is, it, is there two books there? Two books? Yeah, I've got One two book, books, two, yeah. yeah. If, there's two, if you'd like to win a copy of David's books, as ever, go over to our Twitter account and retweet this episode announcement with the words, I want David's books. And then you will be in a chance, in for a chance with winning them. David, thank you for coming on. What's next? Is it all rolled out now? Everything's working? Now is the fun bit, I hope. Now no, we keep talking about 2022, let's hope, with where we are at the moment, the virus. But now is the bit where we can really concentrate on the team. We've got the team all in place. We've kind of got them the job roles that they kind of deserve and hopefully the recognition and... Now should be the bit where we can really develop the people and um, kind of our aim is um, we know it's been a success, we've said, if everybody wants to steal our staff 
um, but nobody wants to leave. So that's kind of the challenge. Like by the oh. end of the year, the next year, that's where I want to be. All right. Well, come on at the end of next year and tell me how that worked out. And I hope all your staff are still with you, but they're but they're being poached like crazy. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, David. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.